So what I'm going to do is just do an introductory talk here to set the stage about genetics. So think of this as genetics 101. Uh, and the reason I'm talking about this is because many of you have uh, wondered about what some of these terms mean, autosomal dominant or compound heterozygote, some of these types of ter terms related to DNA diagnosis. So we're going to talk a little bit about that and talk about genetic counseling, again, for the, as the introduction for moving on to talking about things like prenatal diagnosis and where some of the therapies are going uh, during the rest of the session today. So we all know that our understanding, can I just ask, is, is it supposed to be working up here on this Oh, Sharon, this is your computer. Never mind. OK. Our understanding of genetics has evolved greatly during the last century, but it all started back in 1865 with a monk named Gregor Mendel, who really was the father of the laws of inheritance. And this monk had a garden with peas. And notice that the peas had a variety of different shapes, as did their flowers and their pods. And from this, notice that some were seen much more commonly than others. And he coined the terms dominant trait and recessive trait, and we still counsel about dominant and recessive traits today. It was then in, in 1953 that Watson and Crick first described the structure of DNA, four bases of DNA that are aligned in such a way that a triple helix, as shown here, forms. It's a structure with sugar residues lining on the outside, and then these bases of DNA on the inside. So this is deoxyribose nucleic acid, or DNA. And the structure has these four building blocks, adenine, which pairs with thymine, and guanine, which pairs with cytosine. And here you can see, again, in this schematic, these bases that pair with an assigned partner and a sugar phosphate background that surrounds it. And this DNA acts as our body's instruction manual. Now, what we have is DNA forming this structure within a given gene. Many, many genes are lined up to form a chromosome. The chromosome sits in the nucleus of the cell. And what happens is that we get our instructions ultimately by this DNA arrayed in genes in the nucleus being transcribed into something called ribonucleic acid, or messenger RNA. That happens in the nucleus. The messenger RNA comes out into the cytoplasm, this pink area here outside of the nucleus of the cell, and is then translated there into a series of proteins. And we all know that our proteins are really, really important in driving the function of our cells. Now, a mutation is a change in a gene that results in either no effective protein or a protein that just doesn't really work. Now, to make these proteins, we have what's called the genetic code. Three bases, and you can see again, we've got some of the ones I mentioned before, uh, adenine, cytosine, guanine, and then uracil is a little different. I mentioned thymine before, because uracil is basically thymine in a different, a slightly different form, and that's what's part of RNA. And these form codes, so when you have um, a combination of these, uh, for example, U and U, and then one of these, it may form a certain amino acid, which is the, what composes proteins. And so these various amino acids are spit out then as a result of reading the code, and then they form proteins by serially arraying in a certain configuration and a certain pattern. So this genetic code gets translated into amino acids that then form proteins, and that's what functions in our cells. Sorry, I'm losing the bottom of this. Is there any way to get this all on the screen? So how do we find mutations? Well, uh, before there was DNA testing, which you're going to hear a lot about today, we looked at clinical features, and we really strictly made these diagnoses based on clinical features. Then 
in the 1970s in particular, uh, there was the capability of lining up chromosomes. And these are all chromosomes. Thank you. These are all chromosomes here lined up and showing with different standing banding patterns. And we could try to look for large chromosomal abnormalities by looking at the karyotype, by looking at chromosomes, and looking at these banding. But even now, small mutations, which is largely what we're talking about with genetic disorders, were just not detectable. I want to mention the Human Genome Project. Everybody's heard about this, and this is almost old news by now, that um, a long time ago, 10 years ago, gene sequencing enabled us to find 30,000 genes on our 46 chromosomes. Actually, many smaller genes than we thought existed. And I think if you look, you can see what we just talked about with the DNA basically forming genes that make up our chromosomes. When we talk about EB genetic changes, and you're going to hear a lot about this at this meeting, we find them primarily by then sequencing, figuring out the sequence of these various DNA bases and checking it against what we know to be the normal sequence. So what are the kinds of mutations? The most common type is a substitution, which is replacing one single nucleotide base with another. And that can be divided into two different uh, terms. One is missense. So if you have a missense mutation, it changes one of those DNA bases into another in such a way that when you get to that three-base code that then translates into an amino acid that's part of a protein, it replaces it with an alternative amino acid and still makes the protein. It just has that one amino acid wrong. A nonsense mutation replaces that not with a different amino acid, but with something that basically leads to a code that says, stop reading. Don't make any more amino acids. And that's called a nonsense mutation. Now, frame shift mutation, that's another term you'll hear, occurs when you have a deletion in one or more base pairs. You may have an insertion or addition of one or more base pairs. And that means that it may shift the reading of the gene, because all of a sudden, you've changed that code. And you no longer have the same amino acids coming out. You have a whole string of different ones. And eventually, it gets to what's called a stop codon that stops the reading. It gives a code that says, no more amino acids. You're done with this translation. Um, if the frame shift is in a pattern of threes and stays in it, it, it doesn't really do much. In fact, there may not be any problem at all. But if it gets off of that cycle of three, then it's going to get messed up. And then a splice mutation is a situation where part of the gene is skipped, but the rest is correct. Now, mutations were first found to be causing EB in Laney Fuchs's lab in the 19, early 1990s in families with EB simplex and patients with EB simplex. And subsequently, there was a flurry of discovery for all subsets of EB, junctional subtypes, dystrophic subtypes. Uh, and the first prenatal diagnosis uh, performed by Angela Cristiano, who will be a speaker this morning, uh, in 19, and published in 1996 for recessive dystrophic EB finding collagen 7 mutations. And if I counted right, as of 2012, 12 different genes can be mutated and give the variety of different forms of epidermolysis bullosa. So when we're trying to figure this out, we can do direct genetic testing. Uh, and this can be to confirm or rule out a known or suspected genetic disorder in an effective individual. And to do this, we usually examine DNA from blood for the presence of these mutations. And this most commonly uses a technique that you've probably heard of called PCR, or a polymerase chain reaction. And this is a technique that markedly increases or amplifies pieces of an individual's DNA. And after you do this PCR, you can then sequence or determine 
what that sequence of DNA is and analyze that to see if a mutation is present. There are many new sophisticated techniques that have come along, but largely we still sequence to look at DNA. And there are commercial organizations or other laboratories that will do that, and I just list some of the websites here for those. Now, when is genetic testing useful for a family with EB? First of all, diagnostic testing on an effective individual usually begins, and many of you probably have gone through this, with a skin biopsy. And that skin biopsy, ideally from a newly induced blister, will allow the dermatopathologist who's doing the study to stain with uh, antibodies that are known to recognize certain components of skin and thereby find where the split in the skin occurs, at what level, is it superficial, is it deep, and also to see if certain proteins that may be missing in certain forms of EB are present or absent. Sometimes we may supplement that with a high power microscopy called electron microscopy to try to again look for some specific changes that help us to know the subgroup clinically of epidermolysis bullosa. Okay. But it does not tell us what the genetic change is. It is not at the level of DNA. And so we may want to confirm the diagnosis and get other information by then doing DNA testing. And this is very important, particularly for predictions for the family at this point. We might also want to do DNA analysis to find out if there are family members who carry the gene, not just to be able to consult parents about the fact what the risk is for their offspring, but possibly other family members. And of course, you're going to hear about prenatal testing and pre-implantation diagnosis. Uh, when we hear our talk coming up with Dr. Glick. Now, to talk about genetic counseling, we have to understand the family tree. We've been drawing these family trees in our clinics for years and years, uh, and it looks like this. And we symbolize males by these squares and females by these circles, and this just means we have a married couple who have a certain number of babies, in this case, three daughters and then we can draw the tree all the way down. And by looking at that pattern of inheritance that we can see in a family tree, we can predict the risk with each pregnancy through a technique that involves determination of probability. So we have as an example epidermolysis bullosa simplex, and here we can see, again, there are major types EB simplex in a generalized pattern, or we may have a very localized problem, still quite uncomfortable, uh, but limited to the palms and soles. And EB simplex is usually due to missense mutations in one of two keratins that are partners, keratin 5 and keratin 14, and these live in the, the lowest layer of the um, cells of the epidermis, or the outer layer of skin, and keratin, of course, forms a network from the nucleus to the outer area that helps to support the cell. And when there's an abnormality, just a missense mutation, again, you produce the protein, but it's not normal, and that leads to collapse of these cells and blisters that occur here right through the cell. And you can see these clefts or blisters seen on this being electron microscopy. Now, this is usually an autosomal dominant trait. And when we have an autosomal dominant trait, you have one normal gene given from one parent, and the other parent gives the abnormal gene here with a missense mutation in either keratin 5 or 14. So this is an example of autosomal dominant inheritance. And when we draw the family tree, we can see that a father has passed on to a daughter. A daughter may pass on to a daughter or son. So we tend to see generation after generation with the possibility of an affected individual. And it can be either male or female. And we give that a 50% probability with each pregnancy. Uh, and you can think of it looking at this probability analysis. So let's say we have an affected father. And let's say this D here is the, the defect in the DNA and a normal mom. Well, this D would, by probability, go to two out of four children, or 
50% probability of passing that on. Now, on the other hand, we can think about junctional epidermolysis bullosa. Junctional epidermolysis bullosa results from a variety of mutations that largely tend to lead to no effective protein. And this can be in, for example, one of the three chains of laminin 332, which we see in Hurlitz form of junctional EB. It can be in collagen 17, in integrin alpha 6, beta 4, or plectin. It's even been a case in something called CD151. And these are all components of, of the uh, basement membrane region. Let's go back for a minute. Uh, uh, in the junctional area and are components generally of the hemidesmosome. Now, recessive EB and junctional EB are both uh, recessive disorders, generally. Uh, and recessive EB, of course, is due to mutations in collagen 7 that, again, you pretty much don't have any collagen 7 to be seen, and certainly none that functions very well. So these are autosomal recessive disorders. And again, I'm sorry the bottom of the screen is cut off, but both of the parents each contribute one gene. So we all have two gene copies of every gene we have. The parents each contribute one copy. That's the abnormal gene. So the parents are what are called carriers. They have one normal gene and one abnormal or mutant gene. And having that combination in the case of a recessive disorder leads to no abnormality that's seen. But if you get the double dose, one abnormal gene from each parent then you have no effective gene product, and you show the defect. So this is autosomal recessive inheritance. Uh, and here we can see a bit of a different story. We have unaffected carriers in serial generations, but only one affected individual. And that's the typical pattern that we'll see in a recessive inheritance, where you'll say, but no one in my family has ever had this. Right, but they may all be silent carriers, generation after generation. And unless you have two individuals who carry that gene who marry, they can't have an affected child generally, under most circumstances. Uh, now, if you look at the inheritance pattern here, you'll see we have carriers on both sides, but only one out of four gets that affected uh, dual uh, of the two genes coming, one from each parent. And that's a 25% risk, then, of, of having uh, another offspring who has this particular disorder that's autosomal recessive. 50% chance of having a child who's a carrier, and then a 25% chance of having a normal individual. <coughs> Now, there are some situations where you can have an increased risk, and one is what's called consanguinity. So if two parents are related, there is a much higher risk of having a recessive disorder. And you can understand why, because there uh, is a higher risk that they're both carrying the gene. Usually, that relates to a common ancestor. And the closer the parents are, first cousins versus third cousins, let's say, the higher the risk. Oftentimes, that results in what we call a homozygous mutation, where the gene mutation from mom is the same gene mutation from dad. But there's also a possibility of having what we call a compound heterozygous mutations, where the gene mutation from the mom is different, a different gene, but uh, excuse me, a different mutation, but in the same gene. So we can do double duty and still give you as if just the same type of a picture as if you had a homozygous mutation. So here we have dominant dystrophic, a very different disorder in many ways from recessive dystrophic EB, and yet both relate to mutations in collagen 7. So how can that be? And we think back to what we just talked about, and unfortunately it's not here at all on the screen, but what it would say to you if you could see that low is that um, the individuals who have dominant dystrophic EB almost always have a missense mutation in collagen 7. And that means that there's one amino acid changed 
it's enough to produce a full length collagen 7 protein that gets incorporated into the collagen fibrils, but it just doesn't function totally normally. So the frictional trauma, the trauma leads to blistering and the same kind of scarring and milia formation, formation of these little white dots, as can be seen in recessive dystrophic EB, but without the other problems. In recessive dystrophic EB, on the other hand, we tend to see mutations that occur, one from each parent, where there is no effective protein produced. And that's why we have a much more severe problem in terms of the generalized blistering and all the other features that we know can be part of recessive dystrophic EB. There it is. And these are generally due, again, to nonsense or frame shift mutations. Now, there are some situations that are a little bit different. What's called a compound heterozygous mutation we talked about before, where each parent contributes a different uh, genetic mutation. This sometimes can lead to a severe recessive disorder in a child of a parent with a mild dominant disorder. So we take it for the example of the dystrophic EB that we just talked about. So here's a mom with very mild dominant dystrophic EB. In fact, three siblings had it, her mother had it, her grandmother had it, it was part of the family, nobody thought anything of it, until she had a baby born with much more extensive blistering, recessive dystrophic EB. And another situation of two cousins, one clearly with recessive dystrophic EB and the other with dominant dystrophic EB. Now this is a very rare occurrence, but we do occasionally see it and it's part of what we have to do when we consult. Uh, and this is the situation where in each case, they happen to be marrying a father who turned out to be a carrier for a mutation in collagen seven and that combination then gave a situation where one can have an offspring who actually has recessive dystrophic EB even though a parent has dominant. Again, not something to worry about, but something that we have to think about in consulate. Now, a fuller also is sometimes with our diagnosis, another reason why DNA analysis can be useful. For example, the situation of mild recessive dystrophic EB. So individuals with mild recessive dystrophic EB look like they have um, a, a more severe version of dominant dystrophic EB. No generalized involvement, no hand and foot deformities, not any other issues that we see with recessive dystrophic EB. But later on, many of these individuals have some problem with swallowing. And here, um, it's a, the, the reason that we want to really make that diagnosis is for counseling for families. So each parent, if it is a, uh, it will, will generally not have anything, this is a recessive disorder, uh, we would think that this was a dominant dystrophic EB. But in fact, if the parents come to you and want, or come to me and say, we want to have other kids, what is the risk? You'd look at somebody and you need to know that it's a recessive form even though it's mild because the counseling would be different. Here the counseling would be that they would have a risk of having another child born with a 25% risk. And until you know that gene diagnosis, you wouldn't know that it was recessive. Now, we just talked about a situation that looked like dominant dystrophic EB with neither parent affected. And in fact, that's quite common to have a dominant disorder, whether it's EB simplex or dominant dystrophic EB, and neither parent affected. And then we generally would think that this is most likely to be a new mutation. First time this individual with EB simplex or with dominant dystrophic EB has uh, EB. And then that individual has had a spontaneous mutation, but could pass that along as if a dominant disorder, right? 50% of, of each offspring with each pregnancy could be affected. I'm going to quickly mention some exceptions to the rule. Rarely, for example, EB simplex could be autosomal recessive. Need to figure that out. Parents would have a 25% chance then of having another affected child. Another exception to the rule is that occasionally there's what we call gonadal mosaicism. There are no, a parent is not affected, there are no skin cells involved, no evidence of EB, but there is a genetic change in the sperm or the egg, less than a 50% chance with each pregnancy of having an affected baby, again, called gonadal mosaicism. It only affects the egg and the sperm, but could increase the chance uh, beyond very, very, very negligible of having another offspring affected. And another very unusual situation, but just to be complete, called uniparental disomy. 
this is really rare, but two copies of the same chromosome or part of a chromosome can be passed from one parent and nothing from the other for that particular gene. Um, and again, instead of having one from one parent and one from another, you have this uniparental disomy. And there have been some cases of EB where that has occurred, where what should be a recessive disorder and one parent's uh, is perfectly normal for that gene can occur because two of the mutant copies from the carrier parent got uh, passed on. So then what is the risk estimate for a child? If the genetic status of both parents are known, the risk estimate is straightforward. Uh, if it's both parents known to be carriers, that risk for each pregnancy, and with each one it's a roll of the dice all over again, is 25% an autosomal recessive disorder. If one parent is affected, then that's a 50% risk. This is a dominant disorder passed from generation to generation with a 50% probability. Now, we, we mentioned a minute that ago, possibility, for example, in a disorder like dominant dystrophic EB and recessive dystrophic EB that one parent could have dominant dystrophic, the other could be a carrier, and then, well, I'm sorry, you can't see it at the bottom, but um, then what you would have basically is a 25% risk of any possible combination. 25% risk that the child gets nothing at all, normal from both parents, 25% risk being a carrier, 25% risk of having dominant dystrophic EB, 25% risk of having recessive dystrophic. So a lot of math, a lot of probability, but this is genetic counseling. So in summary, we have the capability of providing counseling about prognosis based on knowing the subtype of EB, which we can confirm originally by immunofluorescence studies. Always want to do immunomapping or some kind of studies to know the subtype as best we can before considering DNA diagnosis, and then ideally going on to identifying specific mutations. We can use DNA analysis and then go to prenatal and pre-implantation diagnosis, as we'll hear about shortly, to advise parents, families of risks prenatally. And then I think one of the reasons that it's so exciting to understand the genetics is because we're in a transitional period right now. Right now, many, many of our patients don't have DNA diagnosis. It wasn't necessary for the families, for example. And right now, our therapy is not necessarily directed in such a way that that would be necessary. But that is changing in many ways. There's new specific therapy that's either going to be specific for the subtype of EB or may even be specific for the precise genetic change. So in the future, I think everyone will probably be having DNA diagnosis. It's also getting cheaper and cheaper to do. Uh, and, uh, but nevertheless, all of these concepts that we're talking about today will still be in place, and I thank you for your attention.